Good afternoon. All right. I have some gray hair too, you know. Right. So you might have noticed that we're in the midst of a presidential campaign. Yeah, where is he going with this, right? Okay, so you might have noticed that we're in the midst of a presidential campaign, but I thought, given last night, that it would be fun to go back to the good old days of 2008 and the Obama-McCain campaign. Now, back then, campaign events looked like this. Lots of signs, lots of people cheering. And because this is a nonpartisan conversation, the same thing happened with McCain, too. But something amazing happened just after that election. It was a seismic shift in our culture, something that affected all of our lives immeasurably. And you can see it four years later in the Obama-Romney campaign. Everything looked different. No more signs and a whole lot more phones. These phones have totally changed our lives. They allow us to do things that we never thought were possible, or in some cases, even necessary. But I think we have yet to really capitalize on the most amazing feature of these phones, and that's the power to heal. Now, of course, for this conversation, I mean the power to heal people who live and work in places like this, and like this, and like this. Now, our work focuses on obesity, which we think is one of the great plagues of our time. And you all know that obesity is related to a wide range of health conditions, many, many, many health conditions, many more than, than I think many of us give credit to. And we particularly focus on the health of women and increasingly their children. Because did you know that a woman who's obese before she becomes pregnant is likely to have a child who becomes obese him or herself earlier in life, and that child is likely to have a higher risk of hypertension by the time that they start kindergarten, likely to have higher rates of autism, and likely even to die earlier in life from things like cardiovascular disease and cancer. And the problem, of course, is that here in the U.S., obesity is rampant among the poor. Most of the American medically vulnerable population is overweight or obese, and increasingly we're seeing the same thing globally as well. But amidst all of these challenges, there's a bright light, there is an opportunity here, and that is that the poor in our country and beyond use their phones a lot. And in fact, they use their phones here so much that we're starting to see new digital divides. The days of the old digital divides are really behind us. And in fact, our new divides look like this. In some cases, medically vulnerable populations here in the U.S. are actually disproportionately more likely to do all of the things that you see listed here. And this gives us an unparalleled ability to turn their phones into treatment tools. So at this point, I'm talking obesity, we're talking technology. I'm sure some of you are thinking about Fitbits and your M Health apps. How many of you are wearing Fitbits? Are their equivalent right now? Okay. I apologize. I'm going to tell you why they don't work, uh, at least for weight loss. And the problem is that for obesity treatment, you really, really need a program. You need to learn skills. You need to learn what to change. You need to have some support, ideally from an expert that can be a human, and increasingly we're finding can also be from an expert computer system like the ones that we create. And you do need to track, you need to self-monitor, but you need to self-monitor or track for five to seven days a week for the six months or so it's going to take you to make a complex behavior change and sustain it. And to get the best outcomes, you need to do all of those things at the same time. Collecting alone isn't changing, and changing requires a programmatic solution. And that would be difficult for any of us to do. It's extraordinarily difficult for most of our patients, but it's especially, import, especially difficult for our most vulnerable patient populations. And I want to tell you about someone who we met in one of our studies, and her name is Sandra. Uh, Sandra is a woman who lives in Burlington, North Carolina. It's about 20, 25 minutes from here. Uh, and she would tell you she's poor. Now, by the standards of many developing nations, uh, she's probably doing okay. But, but by U.S. standards, she's struggling. She wants to be a nurse one day, but she knows that's just not in the cards for her right now. So she's just working hard and trying to save money for, and for her future education and trying to be a good example to her kids. She has obesity, hypertension, and prediabetes. She would tell you that she gets down sometimes. She would tell you she's stressed out. As a psychologist, I would call that depression. She doesn't have access to healthful food options in her local environment. Uh, in fact, she shops here. And incidentally, she doesn't take her kids food shopping with her because she doesn't want uh, them to see her use her food stamps. Now, she and Sandra's like most Americans in that she struggles with challenges with literacy and numeracy, and she would have difficulty telling you the number of calories she consumed if she ate this entire container of ice cream. 
So Sandra needs more than what's offered in most weight loss treatments. The standard of care these days looks like this. Complex, logistically challenging, heavily reliant on numeracy and literacy skills. And these things just don't work for patients who have the highest risk of the condition. And that's really where we came in. We created a digital treatment that we call IOTA. And it's more than an app. It's a comprehensive treatment solution, and it looks like this. Basically, patients come in, they fill out a very short survey on one of our computers, and they tell us their likes, their dislikes, uh, their attitudes, their behaviors. We take all of those data, we throw them into the cloud, and then we can generate a series of very straightforward goals for people to do. They, if they track these goals, they'll lose weight, and we can make changes in their goals to help them to lose weight more effectively. We ask them to track. When they track via text message or one of our other technologies, uh, we give them personalized feedback. We can make those feedback even more personalized by using weight data that we're collecting in their homes. We take all of that data and we put it in front of their coaches. We've worked with lay health providers, we've worked with community health educators, all the way up to registered dietitians. We can even put uh, counseling recommendations into the electronic health record. And this very low cost, scalable approach works. It works extremely well. And over the last decade, we've tested it in more than four randomized controlled trials and it does all the things that you see listed here. Now, we first met Sandra in one of our studies that was designed to prevent weight gain. And amazingly, the challenge with this is that Sandra and women like her gain a lot of weight each year, somewhere between two to four pounds a year. So even if they start their adulthood at relatively low levels of obesity, by the time that they reach menopause, they put on enough weight that health problems are all but inevitable. And in just a year, Sandra is participated in one of our programs and she stopped gaining weight. But things really got interesting four years later. We came back and we said, what's happened in that period of time? And in that four-year period of time, people in our control group who didn't use our app, they gained on average 11 pounds. Sandra and the women like her who used the app, though, just stopped gaining weight. And I mentioned that Sandra was depressed. More than a quarter of every patient population that we work with is clinically depressed at baseline. This approach reduces depression by 70%. And so the Surgeon General here in the United States suggested that this is the kind of approach that we should be rolling out to patients that need it most. We agree. Now we're taking this approach global and we're starting in China. We're starting in China for lots of reasons, not the least of which is that we're beginning to really see the obesity epidemic hit hard there, particularly in younger aged populations. And we've taken this IOTA approach to China, we've tested it there, and in China it sort of looks like, looks like that. Um, don't check my Mandarin. But amazingly, this approach not only works, but it works even better than it does here in the US. We see bigger weight losses, bigger reductions in cardiovascular risk. And so, one last thing. If you're not with me, if you're not an interventionist, and you don't necessarily buy into this whole digital revolution idea, then just take this piece home with you. In our last trial, we asked our really disadvantaged patient population to track using our app every day for a year. What proportion of people do you think that did that? Every day or once a week for an entire year, what proportion of people do you think did it? Yeah, 20%? 20% would be pretty good in the commercial market. Um, we found that it was 93.2%. Historically disconnected, rural, socioeconomically disadvantaged patient populations will use these technologies and they will use them in ways that I think none of us could have imagined. And we don't even need a fancy phone, a really simple flip phone that some of you may have in your pockets right now. That's all that you need. In fact, we, we focus on smartening phones that we are probably dumb phones. And so right now, as we're seeing increasing penetration of these technologies all over the world, we think that this is the approach that will allow us to reach out, engage with, and improve the health of disconnected and vulnerable populations globally. And through our center, Duke Digital Health, we're now exploring ways of giving these technologies away for free. Thank you.